uh, there is quite a bit of detail here in terms of individual sessions. But if you take a minute and check the schedule at a glance, it just shows you the whole overview quickly. And um, though it is fairly familiar to a lot of folks who've been coming to ABRF for a few years, a little bit different flavor that I want to talk about, uh, especially because we've made some really great uh, content contributions that are going to make it hard for some folks to pick what session to go to. Um, so before even going there, I will let everybody know that almost all sessions will be recorded. So though those challenges to pick what you'd like to go to may be hard, uh, know that if you miss a session, there'll be content after the fact. And as with every ABRF meeting, there's there's going to be tons of time to connect with uh, colleagues, uh, new and old, to to either hear about what's going on or or find uh, processes and, and and items you can work on together moving forward. Um, so the first day is going to be just our our full day half day workshops, which you'll hear a little bit about in the future. Uh, and then we'll have our keynote, who's with us today, Beth Smuni, who's going to talk uh, to you about what she'll be chatting with. I'm sure she would love some feedback. So uh, if there's time for her to speak her, her, her session, though I'm sure it's it's, it's well oiled, uh, that can be incorporated. Uh, and then we'll have our reception, including uh, a portion of the reception that's going to be hosted by our chapters. So if you're new at ABRF or if you haven't been part of a chapter in the past, you'll have a chance to engage with some folks from the chapters and just learn what it means to, to go to those regional meetings that Ken mentioned briefly. Uh, all three of the days follow a somewhat familiar format with breakouts and plenary sessions. What we're doing is a little bit of a build on from last year in that each day is going to start with some technology showcases. And then we go into two plenaries, same time, uh, but group will be divided. Uh, I won't go into details of all of the plenaries because I, I, I will take the whole meeting time here. Uh, but long and short is we've divided up based on thematic areas. So uh, just to use this first one as an example, and I recognize my screen probably isn't uh, super easy for folks to see. Um, we'll have a con conversation about correlative data in histology and imaging cores. So uh, you, you may affiliate with that, or you may be able to go and see uh, what's happening at data cores. And we're also going to have a really great presentation by a shared instrumentation grant uh, folks. We have people coming from NIH, NSF, and from a Massachusetts organization, MLSC, to talk about kind of the state of things. And then after all of our plenary sessions, which happen uh, three times throughout the meeting, we're going to have concurrent sessions immediately following that should follow some of the conversations you're having so you can carry on. So for example, the shared instrumentation grant opportunities will be followed by a breakout where we can get into conversations with some of those folks who are on the panel and amongst ourselves to see about future potential for uh, shared instrumentation grants, how they're working, what we can do better. Uh, and, and typical to ABRF fashion, just have really good conversations about what we all are experiencing out in the field. Um, our lunches are two hours uh, during this meeting, and that's intentional, uh, partially because we're having our poster sessions during lunch times. And I say sessions because there are uh, going to be a session at each of the lunch time. Um, for those who have submitted posters, thank you. We have quite a bit of good poster content that we're looking forward to seeing. Uh, the jury posters, those that will be reviewed for uh, Waters Award will be on this first day. Uh, and then on the Tuesday and Wednesday, those posters will still be up to view, but we're gonna be focusing more on those informational type posters that are uh, content about what you all are doing out in the field that is great and we wanna hear about, or maybe some content from our sponsors who are showing new technologies they have. So again, there'll be poster sessions each and every day during the lunchtime break. Um, our ABR forward there follows in the afternoon, and then we're going to a more traditional concurrent session and here's where your timing and your, your choices of what you pick is going to get hard. Um, when we developed these concurrent sessions, there was a lot of overlap, or, or I should say a lot of great content that has maybe some similar threads that some folks may see as, well, this looks like a lot of admin heavy. What we really tried to focus on is management throughout your, your, your path in the, in the core. So if you are a new technician working with core facilities or you are a senior administrator, uh, there should be a session here for you. Uh, and regardless of what you're doing in the core, there should be some great content no matter the sessions. So here in this concurrent session time block, it's non-sponsored. And these are supposed to be sessions that are really focused on, um, a, again, a different component of management of cores, depending on where you are in your career. Uh, then we'll have some traditional concurrent sessions broken up by, by themes. This on the first day is really where our research groups and committees are going to have focused time to tell you what's going on, what they've been working on the last year, and what they have coming up. So Again, those of you in ABRF, you're probably familiar with what some of the research groups are doing, but if you haven't been at ABRF in the past, this is a great chance for you to hear what's going on and find some place you might want to get involved. Um, that's as deep as I'll go into a singular day, but just to comment on uh, the next day follows a very similar format. Again, two thematically focused plenary sessions, 
uh, concurrent that follow those. In some cases, they're standalone sessions, a long two hour lunch break with the intent that you would get to, a chance to go to the posters and talk to the folks that are there. One more plenary sessions, future concurrent. Uh, and then concurrent that is standalone that doesn't have anything specifically to do with the plenaries, but is our more traditional format and, and um, uh, theme focused. Our last day is going to be special for, for a few different reasons, aside from just some great content. We're focusing this last day on involvement with the community colleges uh, consortium. So the entire day is open for folks in the regional or wherever they, they may be, community college arena, to work with us, to come see what it is. Uh, that ABRF does and how we can overlap. There'll be presentations by the NSF AGE group. Oop, that was an unintentional click, sorry about that. Um, and really the intent is to get folks, whether they are faculty at community colleges or community college uh, attendees or folks in other areas of academia that could be working with community colleges to understand the great work that is done in core facilities and how this could be helpful for the core's world. Um, we'll start the day again with tech showcases and then the DEI award. Uh, going to concurrent sessions, again, you'll see a lot of overlap where some of these are similar in theme, but depending on where you are in your career or who you are, whether community college or a senior administrator, there's something here for you. Uh, networking lunch, again, two hours to meet with some of those posters. We're also having a session, and if we haven't put out the call for this yet, keep an eye out, where those who are attending from community colleges can come meet with folks one-on-one -on -one and learn what it's like to be in the core, whether you are a genomic specialist or you are an administrator or you are working on microscopes, or you are a technician that supports multiple types of cores, it's a chance for folks that aren't in this world to come talk and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and see what it means. Maybe there's career opportunity, maybe there's a chance for them to con contribute to ABRF at large, but regardless, it's a more um, uh, uh, intimate way to chat with people and find uh, uh, conversations you might not be willing to have in the larger sessions. We'll go into one last block of concurrent sessions have our poster award, which will be fairly quick, and then our closing keynote by Ed Boyden. Uh, and with that, I think I went way over the time I planned, but I will again remind everybody that there is a great program that is continually being updated as we get more information. Uh, and I'll stop babbling so we can get to the people who are, who are giving uh, actual talks. Uh, first up is gonna be Beth, but I will ask that if you do have questions about the content, about the meeting as a whole, about anything we're talking about, ABRF or otherwise, please do feel free to put it in the chat and we'll make sure to get to those conversations. So with that, I'll turn it over to Beth. Oh, Andrew, I think we're going to ask Marie, who, our oh. president-elect, who's joined us. Thank you, Marie. Apologies, to, Ken. I'll let you be <laughs> That's okay. To welcome, welcome Beth. Hello, Marie. Hi, and welcome, everybody. Uh, apologies for being late. Um, yeah, right now I'd like to introduce Beth Samini, who's one of our uh, keynote speakers. Uh, Beth is the uh, imaging platform director at the Broad Institute. Um, and she is going to be uh, giving us a preview of the presentation she's going to be giving on uh, our Sunday night. And that is Making Morph Neuromicroscopy Microscopy Advances in High Content Image Analysis. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, I do want to just, I'm not the platform director, but I am one of the senior group leaders at the imaging platform at the Broad. We're excited to welcome you all to Boston. And I'm incredibly excited to be back at ABRF this year and to be speaking to you all. So just a, a quick preview of uh, some of the content you're going to be getting. Um, what the imaging platform focuses on is image analysis, which has been for most of the history of microscopy considered a pretty qualitative field. Um, I'm glad I wasn't doing uh, microscopy back in these days, although we're all very grateful to Ramoni Cajal's art skills. Um, mine are not so good. Um, but thankfully, the digital camera was invented. Um, and now we have images that are ultimatic, ultimately just mathematical arrays uh, that we can use to extract data from. The problem being that human brains are not built for quantifying data. Um, and that's part of the reason that digital images are so important. When I first put this image up, or possibly still, uh, if you're looking at this on a small screen, this looks like a color image. It's not. This is a grayscale image with some color lines drawn on top of it. But your brain is trying to fill in the missing picture so you can get an idea of what the scene around you looks like really quickly. And so it treats this as a color image. Uh, so your brain is more important with giving you, uh, thinks it's more important to give you the gist of the idea of what's going around than actually accurately reporting what is happening in the world around you. So even for phenotypes that you don't necessarily think need uh, quantification uh, when it comes to microscopy images, we actually really recommend that you do it. 
Um, and we're passionate about using images. Um, we love all of the omics, and I'm going to talk uh, for a minute or so about how we integrate with some other omics towards the end of this preview. But we love images because you can get multiplex information, you get information from live cells, you can see not just um, where molecules are, how much of them are, but sort of how they're changing um, within a cell as opposed to sort of across cells. And so images have this real, these really great powers that even the super incredibly powerful other omics techniques don't necessarily all have at the same time. And computational analysis can help us get data from things in a lot of different ways. This figure is originally sort of about deep learning, but um, even though deep learning is a very trendy buzzword right now, not everything that you do in image analysis has to involve deep learning. And we can do things like finding cells or any other objects that you care about and extracting features or uh, measurements from them um, pretty mo so much better now than we could you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, one of the things I was first introduced to when I joined the Broad was um, this idea of a cell painting assay, which is designed to be an assay where we can find all the compartments of cells and essentially how many stains can we cram into the standard high content imager that many of your imaging cores may have access to so that we can find all of the organelles within a cell. Um, this is something that was invented at the Broad in the, the late um, aughts, early 2010s. Um, and the reason you would want to do this and the reason you would want to identify or just where organelles are is that we're we want to push that people treat imaging the way people have started treating um, single cell RNA-seq for uh, gene expression or GWAS for um, DNA and, and as the other sort of high, con uh, high content, high throughput omics come on board. We want imaging to be treated this way too, where we can just extract lots and lots and lots of measurements of cells. Um, our typical assay, we now do about 6,000 measurements of each cell. And then be able to treat this uh, with high unsupervised clustering and all of the other fancy uh, bioinformatics that have been developed over the years to sort of see what connections there are between samples to help us find our unknowns unknowns in imaging and not just our known unknowns. Um, and it turns out that this works. Um, this is one of my favorite early papers in the field. Um, with just a nuclear stain for these known classes of drugs, you can uh, identify cells back to their uh, their classmates with 67% accuracy just based on the nucleus. If you add in actin and tubulin, you can get 94% accuracy of uh, using images of cells to predict to group drugs into classes. Um, there are a lot of other really cool applications that I'm not going to go into in detail. But um, you can do things like group genes into their uh, gene classes and even detect if there are mutants that behave slightly differently than what the wild types behave like. Um, you can combine imaging with other omics. So this is a preprint we have out uh, collaborating with a bunch of groups right now using the cell painting and these image-based profiling techniques to look at uh, single variants in iPSCs from many donors to actually see which um, genetic variants which came from whole genome sequences actually lead to changes in cell morphology and therefore give us some idea about what some of these unknown variants might be doing. Cell painting is also a really great thing to be able to put into virtual screening for predictable assays. So if there's an assay that's currently, even with the, the scale of hardware acceleration that we're seeing these days, hard to scale or expensive to do or just a pain, you can predict using these image-based uh, image profiling features or the images themselves how other assays would have turned out, including things like gene expression assays, which is this L1000. I'm going to point at some uh, resources. So if you don't have millions of cell painting images handy where you want to start trying to do some of these techniques, um, where we have some open data that is going to allow you to try them on your own. Um, but with the understanding that a lot of these computational techniques, um, the expert uh, who spends their time doing the actual wet lab versus the analysis um, might have different computational comfort levels. One of the biggest questions I'm going to try and answer is how can I learn how to do this stuff and where can I go for help? And for the answer to that, stay tuned and we will see you in May in Boston. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, as a genomics person, I am really interested to hear you talk about that integration. So I will definitely be there. Um, next, we'd like to transition to some other uh, workshop based uh, meeting or workshop based parts of the meeting uh, that will be happening on Sunday. Um, these do involve a separate registration. Um, so that is available on the website. And if you have any questions, you can also send me or Ken or ask a question about it in the chat.
Uh, first, we're going to have Jeff Smith talk about the uh, business skills workshop. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> if you could undisable the sharing. <laughs> Should be available now, Jeff. Okay. There. Can everybody see that? Looks great. Hopefully. Okay. Um, this is um, uh, welcome, everybody. And this is the um, basically uh, the outline for the business skills workshop uh, that will be held on Sunday. Um, this workshop is usually a day and a half, but we've um, kind of compressed things down to you know to fit. The day, and I know that there's been a little bit of um, uh, varying uh, time slots that have been advertised, and it's actually from 8 a.m. until 4:30, and um, and you know just to give people time to uh, you know get to the five o'clock um, activities uh, after the workshop on Sunday. So, anyway, um, basically, what we try to do in this workshop is um introduce people to the fact that you know cores are driven by science and you know that's that's the the, the primary driver the main driver of of any core facility but there's also other things there's a business side to it and many people are are you know um you know, walk into a core facility whether it's a director a manager or even just a staff member and basically, their background is science, and even a, a uh, an administrator, really, you know, um, that you know maybe you know oversees grants and and contracts and things of that nature, really have very little knowledge of of what a core facility is in terms of a, a, a business sense. So what we do is we define the, the core facility as a business model, and then we go through the process of you know. How does one, you know, uh, make a business plan a, for a new facility, you know, a new core, or, you know, even um, a five-year plan for an existing core? Uh, of course, there's rate setting and compliance. Um, you know, the the um, cores are, uh, you know, the, you know, um, uh, controlled by a regulatory process by the federal government, and they have uniform guidance that provides uh, information of certain things you can and can't do with a core facility um, and how you charge your rates and so on. And the rate setting is, you know, goes through the detail of, of that process of, you know, how to, you know, you know, set your rates, whether it's, you know, your a, a equipment-based core or your service-based core or hybrid. Um, and there's also marketing, you know, how do you make people, you know, aware that your core exists? And uh, capital equipment, of course, is is a big um, component of uh, you know of operating a core, and uh, also strategic management. You know, what's the long term? What's the what's the long game? And how do we plan? You know, because there's a lot of unknowns. You know, the, the you know different technologies and things ch are constantly changing. So, you know, how do you how do you plan for that? And then, of course. There's the important, you know, component of, of core evaluation or assessment. How are we doing? You know, what's my core doing? Is it is it relevant? You know, are we keeping up with technology? Um, are our rates competitive or, you know, in line with what either the, the market or other institutions are doing? So there's a lot of different moving parts to, um, you know, to, uh, you know, the business side. So what we're trying to do is bring together the science side and the business side together so that there's a, an overall understanding of really, you know, a core facility is a business. And even though it is, you know, a, a zero sum there, you're not making a profit, um, it's still a business. And, and it's very important that not only do people on the science side understand this, but also people on the administrative side understand the relationships and, and the requirements and the different things. So, what we will uh, try to do is, is provide people with, you know, presentations and um, activities and hopefully 
um, if time permits, some hands-on and some case uh, case studies and things of that nature um, that can be discussed. And uh, hopefully, you know, this will give you a matrix because um, of really what you need to be looking at, because every institution is a little bit different in how they handle certain things. So we want to just give you the, the framework that, you know, people will be able to go back to their institution and, and apply some of these principles to how they're uh, you know, their institution manages some of these, uh, these issues. So, um, so if there's any questions, put them in the chat and um, we can answer them. Other than that, um, I think that's about it. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, if this is a session that is in, of interest to anyone, I would encourage you to register quickly. Uh, I believe there are actually only a few spots, few spots that are left open for it. Yes, and one one further thing. Um, this is a program that we're trying to develop, uh, and we've gotten requests from institutions to actually take this workshop on the road and, and to provide it as a service to, you know, any institution that would like, you know, to have this uh, workshop, you know, uh, you know, for their people in their core facilities. Um, so in, in doing that, we're, I, we're still in the process of, of really formalizing a, a, the program. And one of the things I want to throw out there for you, more experienced people, um, we're looking for additional instructors and other people that are interested in participating, either in developing or maintaining content or anything of that nature. Uh, we would really like you to, you know, uh, to be a part of this because right now, uh, with this last go round, we had a lineup of, of individuals and two of them had to drop out because of uh, unforeseen circumstances. So we, you know, we need to have other people in place as well. So if you are interested, contact Ken, myself, uh, Bill Hendrickson, or, um, you know, Roxanne uh, Ashworth, uh, any of those individuals will be able to, uh, you know, um, uh, get in touch with us and, and we can put you on the list. So. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we're going to have Christina uh, discuss her uh, implementing spatial transcriptomics in core facilities. Is Christina with us? Well, perhaps we've lost Christina. Okay. In that case, um, let's have uh, Chris talk about his uh, his workshop using RR Studio for reproducible data analysis and visualization. Thanks, Marie. So my name is Chris Gates, and I'm the managing director of the bioinformatics core at the University of Michigan. And I'm on the team that's hosting the workshop on using RR Studio for reproducible data analysis and visualization. Now, at the bioinformatic core, we're working with researchers to identify and interpret patterns in biological data. And a big part of what we do, because it is so computational, is we have to make computers work harder so we can all do more meaningful work. And our motivation for this workshop is we wanna share some of those techniques with the research <laughs> community to raise the quality and impact and efficiency of research at large. Now, all cores, no matter what the nature of the core is, uh, are working with data. And sometimes sharing that raw data is the best way to tell a story, but more often you can tell the story better if you give it a little bit of help. Sometimes a simple transformation can elevate the story you're trying to tell or add emphasis or focus. And quite often having a visualization is a concise way to communicate the story. That's where R and R Studio come in. R is like a workbench for working with data. It's a tool that lets you integrate and transform tables and also create visualizations that help communicate the ideas. I use R in my work, both for research data, but also as a managing director, I use R and R Studio for working with administrative data. So I'm gonna take a minute and talk about what we're gonna talk about in the workshop. So first off, this is a workshop that's designed for folks with no coding experience. So we're really starting from the ground level. And the workshop itself is really, it's kind of like a narrated live coding exercise. We're gonna be using example data sets to demonstrate techniques and work our way through increasingly interesting exercises, both working together and also working individually with support. One of the first things we're gonna do is 
just orient people around what they're looking at when they're in an R studio environment, and also talking about the most important tools that you're using to load data and transform data. And we'll start talking about the idea of a table, uh, which is one of the most important structures in working with data and working in an R, R studio. Now, when you're starting to talk about a table, um, a table seems kind of like an innocuous piece of data, but as soon as you introduce the idea of a table, almost instantly you're thinking about ways to transform it sometimes you want to just look at a subset of rows or sometimes you want to look at a subset of columns or sometimes maybe in a more nuanced way you want to summarize a large table into a smaller table we're going to take a deep dive into a related set of libraries whose whole purpose is to transform tables into other tables and ultimately prepare those tables so that we're ready to visualize the data now as beth alluded to we are visual creatures. We're actually pretty good at seeing patterns visually. And to that end, we're gonna walk through a really powerful library of functions that's collectively called ggplot. This is a library where all of the functions are solely dedicated to creating clean, concise, expressive plots of your data. And we're gonna explore uh, more than a few different kinds of ways to plot data. Now, there are different tools that let you transform data and lets you visualize data, but one of the superpowers in r, r Studio is the ability to collect all of these transformations and visualizations together to collect those steps into something called a script. This script, the idea of being able to script these things is really sets R apart from some of the simpler tools. And I want to take a deeper dive into why scripts are so powerful. The first is very obvious, and that is that it's a way to automate these transformations. So you start with raw data and then run a script and you have your finished product. Now, the first time you're developing that script, that obviously takes some effort. But the second time you run the script, it's quite easy. And any subsequent runs are pretty much trivial. But beyond that, once you've done that for one input, you can do that for other inputs, related inputs, maybe an updated input. So you have reuse and reproducibility. Beyond that, if you can do that for a couple small files, there's nothing that would stop you from doing that to a bunch of files or maybe some very, very large files. So you've got scalability. And finally, by using a script, you're taking that information outside of your head and you're making it institutional knowledge. This is a transformation and a deliverable that you can now share with your collaborators. You can have them maintain that script or extend that script or simply have them run that script on your behalf. So all in all, um, we're going to bring our expertise and a preloaded R environment. And again, a reminder that this is designed for folks with no coding experience. You just bring your curiosity and a laptop. And at the end of the workshop, you're going to be able to use our studio to read in and transform tabular data. You're going to be able to create various kinds of visualizations. And you're going to be able to create scripts to make your work reproducible and share shareable. We think you could learn a lot and we think this is gonna be a lot of fun. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time and attention and uh, uh, there's still spots open. So if you have any interest at all, please register and we're ha I'm happy to answer any questions that come up in chat. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, I was wondering, cause this is one of our biggest issues with data visualization is, uh, do you have any tips and trips, tricks that you're gonna talk about in the uh, webinar for people to give you uh, good starting data sets, um, for instance, ones that aren't color coded and ones that have uh, all the data existing in the same columns. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, if you spend any time around data and visualizing data, like what you become aware of is there's the notion of clean data and dirty data. And there are ways that you can structure data that as humans um, uh, are probably sufficient but in terms of actually processing the data, um, it requires some effort, sometimes substantive effort to get it from its raw form into a form that's ready for visualization. So uh, the, the simple answer to your question is yes. We are gonna talk about best practices to structure data on the raw side and also some common techniques to transform those into more reusable uh, data sets. Thanks, that's a great question. Wonderful, thank you. <clears throat> Um, if there are no other questions right this second for Chris. Um, next, we're going to have uh, Sheena Mache talk about uh, 
her seminar on uh, effective use of data repositories to enable rigor, reproducibility, and transparency in research while meeting the NIH data management plan. <laughs> Thank Sheena, you, do I get that off? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we, I think we have the, the longest title for any of the pre-meeting workshops. So that's got to count for something. And I am not giving this workshop. Um, this is this is sponsored um, and developed by CCOR, you know, the Committee for Core Rigor and Reproducibility. And we have assembled a team of data experts representing the research data lifecycle. So I'm going to share the slide that Andrew Ott put together, which I modified a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I think this should do it. Yes. Can everyone see that? Yes. yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so, so why did we think that this was a good idea for a workshop? Well, um, it's all about data management and sharing. We have an increasing number of funding agencies and journals and other stakeholders that are requiring data producers to manage their data and have a very good and clear way of uh, how they're going to share archive and, and uh, where's the data gonna be available. So we all know as core scientists, as core administrators, <clears throat> that data is the key deliverable of all research cores. And so our core scientists and administrators need to have this knowledge. So this is why we put this workshop together. Um, this workshop will provide crucial information on institutional best practices for data management and sharing. Participants will learn how to access building blocks and how to select appropriate data archiving sites and repositories. <clears throat> and we're going to use um, image data as an example. Um, so we have a terrific lineup of speakers. Uh, Nicole Contaxis, who is a data librarian, and she has led um, a lot of efforts, um, including um, work with uh, DataWorks, the Facet DataWorks, um, and she is going to, um, you know, start us off. We have uh, two speakers from Globus, Ricada and Brigitte, who will be speaking about their uh, Globus uh, tool, and then Valeria and Michelle, who are both uh, scientists, um, uh, Valeria from NYU and Michelle from UNC. And they will be using examples in terms of image data for, um, for the repository work that we're going to be showing. So we feel that the workshop participants will really be able to go back to their home institution to contribute to their institutional data management planning. Um, and more importantly, implement a sound research data life cycle from project planning to the end of the, to the, end of the project. And um, again, this is all about data sharing and we feel that this would be a terrific workshop for people to uh, take, whether you're a core scientist, whether you're interested in image data, this is about the building blocks. This is about getting a better understanding of what data management and sharing is all about. Um, so I think I'll leave it there unless there are questions. There is, Sheena. Um, there's a question in the chat. Will the workshop cover cost implications? For instance, uh, data hard drives, software, yes. AWS, yes. those types of things. Yes. Excellent. I know at my institution, that is always a big question of even when to keep something internal versus when to move it up to the cloud. So, well, as you know, for every for every um, for every IT expert, there is uh, a different opinion. But I will say that we do try to stress the best practices and what has worked. You know, the important thing to remember is that. Every core, every institution is different. And so, you know, we've really tried to make this workshop a, a highly interactive and participat participatory workshop. Um, and we look forward to everyone learning from one another. Wonderful. Okay. There is a second question. Um, 
Will you offer strategies to partner with IT departments at institutions? Absolutely. That's one of our favorite topics. Yes. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sheena. And You're welcome. last but not least, um, Kathy Schaefer. I uh, will be discussing um, some education topics, rethinking skills, education, and training for core employees and developing a, a community college curricula. Sorry, I was muted there. Hi, this is Kathy Schaefer. Can you see my screen? Oh, I good. Not. Yep. All right. Um, so I and Jane Trevastava are going to be presenting a pre-meeting workshop, which is Rethinking Skills Education and Training for Core Employees. And this is um, a workshop where we are going to be discussing the development of community college core curriculum development. And it's a little different than some of the training you might have for your discipline, which is very academic. We are going to be looking at this from a biotech community college perspective and have core skills in there as well, such as instrument management and um, interacting with your field service engineers and um, customer or consumer um, interacting soft skills. So we're excited to present this and why we were kind of interested in working on a community college curricula is that we actually have um, a real problem filling some of our open positions right now. So um, in 2021, the Flow Cytometry Research Group gave a workshop, or I'm sorry, a survey, we put it out to the Flow um, Cytometry community about um, different topics that was going on um, during COVID. And one of our questions was, do you currently have open staff positions? And we found that 27% of the respondents actually had open positions in their core. So there's a real shortage of technically trained staff to fill these open positions in our cores. And um, ABRF has teamed up with Innovate Bio to submit an NSF grant they did this this past November to support the development of community college core skills training. And um, flow cytometry is currently the pilot program for this community college core curricula development. But we are going to be also doing this for the different core disciplines within ABRF. And so why these two teaming up? You all are members of ABRF, so you know about our strengths. But for Innovate Bio, they are providing training in college programs, high school programs, um, to train up in STEM relevant education for industry, biotech, um, academic, and they have a reach all across the United States and all of these different um, community colleges that we as ABRF would like to team up with to partner to be able to have these training programs and potentially ABRF provide internship opportunities and also as an added benefit, get technically trained people to come in and man our staff. So you can see the blue dots here are ABF core institution locations and the yellow dots are Innovate Bio supported community colleges. So we're very well paired up and um, looking forward to having some wonderful collaboration. So right now flow cytometry is the pilot course for this core curricula training. Um, and we have these other disciplines that we've identified within ABRF that we wanna have develop these core um, courses, but also want to, if you have other cores or these niches, we can talk about developing that too. So 
inside of this workshop, we want to talk about some of the issues around training and hiring core staff that we're all having. What are the main influences, um, sorry, issues influencing the core staff training and retention? What technical and soft skills are important for junior employees? What do students need to learn about your specific core discipline? And how can we best design a course to teach those skills? And again, not just your technical skills, but some of the soft skills that are necessary. And what initiatives and policies can companies, industries, research institutes develop to recruit and retain the incoming staff? So if you want to get involved, join our workshop join an ABRF research group to help design and, and write these modules. Think about local community colleges where internships can be um, offered and resource provision. What can you do to create course materials? Volunteer to test and critique lessons that are being designed. And also look for those community colleges that don't have access to core instrumentation and potentially provide that. So um, the grant was entered in October, and again, to increase the pool of trained, skilled entry-level technicians, and come to our workshop if you want to learn more and participate. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. And you mentioned um, for those of those people who may not be able to go to the workshop, um, you do have a flow-specific um, session during the meeting as well, correct? Yes, we do on um, Wednesday morning, the 1030 to 12 um, session, we will have a 90 minute um, portion of this more flow based. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you everybody um, for discussing your workshops. Um, I hope there's something that is interesting to uh, everybody on this call. Um, we'd love to see everyone get their uh, participation in the workshop as well as uh, some meeting participation and uh, both the virtual and in-person uh, meeting attendees have any questions that you'd like to have answered. If not, uh, Andrew, uh, would you like to make some final closing comments? Yeah, Marie, thank you very much. And thanks again, everybody for joining today. I Mostly was remiss in, in thanking uh, the program committee as a whole, uh, Marie Adams, James Chambers, Kathy Cormier, Carolyn Zanaf, Chris Gilpin, Stuart Levine, Trisha Rogers, and Sue Weintraub. Uh, they, they have worked with a lot of people on the call to make the great content. Um, so please make sure you, you, you chat with them at the session and thank them for all they do. Um, a couple of questions that were asked in the chat that hopefully everybody saw. One, every session is gonna be recorded. So uh, if for some reason you're not able to participate virtually, uh, or in person, though that's what we'd really have to see. There will be availability after the fact to see some of these sessions. Um, also, there is virtual participation, as has been mentioned, and Ken put in the link there a chat so that you can register to help us in those sessions. Uh, those who are the meeting last year will remember that we have somebody in the room to look at the the, the conversations that are happening and share conversations or questions with the the, the, the session host. So, <clears throat> if you're not participating formally in a session. You'll be there and you would be willing to, to help moderate and share questions. Please sign up. Uh, we'd, we'd love to have your help. We're going to be having a training about a week before uh, the meeting itself to let people know what to expect and what to bring and be ready for. Um, two last things, again, some, some non-traditional attendee options. Uh, one, can put in the chat as well that you can come for just a single day. So if you're in the area uh, and you have a crazy schedule, but you know there's some great content, you can sign up for one day and participate that well that way. Uh, and also, I, I didn't mention on the last day, there are two things that I didn't mention. One, uh, especially for those folks in the area, <clears throat> we would really love folks to come meet with our vendors. We know that this meeting is possible because of their phenomenal sponsorship. Uh, and if you have folks in your labs that would love to come talk to our sponsors, they can come and engage just at the vendor hall for, for a low fee. Be able to engage with everybody, talk to them, have some good conversations. The members from the meeting as a whole will be in the hall as well. So a great chance to get some light engagement, but most importantly, show our vendors how important they are to us. Uh, and last but not least, I don't know how I was remiss in saying that the closing social will be at Fenway Park. So if you are on the fence about coming in person, I don't know what else you need to know besides the fact that you'll be at to be within those held, held walls. So uh, those are the few things I forgot to mention and, and uh, I'll, I'll stop chatting now and just really grateful for all the help I've had and, and looking forward to seeing everybody in person. Thank you, Andrew, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone in Boston.